All right. So today we're going to talk about quality testing in the field. So I've had people tell me, we made some concrete, it's cracked, it's discolored, it doesn't meet specifications, but it's good concrete. We made the concrete, we're proud of it. And literally that is the definition of bad concrete. So how do you know, how do you figure out if it's good or if it's bad concrete? Obviously if it doesn't meet specifications, it's not good concrete. At least it's not good for that application. So is this good concrete? You know, it looks good. looks like they're doing everything right. But how do you exactly know? How do you know the strengths are going to be there? Well, you got to test for it. So for ACI fill grade one, or if you work with a DOT, they're going to have something very equivalent. And they're going to have a series of tests. Usually they're going to provide at least temperature. So they want to go and figure that the... the the fresh temperature of that concrete when it's delivered to the con or when it's delivered to the site and it's being placed they want to measure slump so how you know the consistency of of the concrete to fall they also want to look at unit weight you learn a lot from unit weight whether it's air uh, too much water in the mix how how close is that unit weight compared to the unit weight or the unit weight of the actual design? Because that can tell you relative yield and how close you are actually truly yielding to, um, to, to perfect. You look at the batch ticket. And then finally, your air content. So how freeze thaw durable that concrete is going to be and that's real important especially for transportation work because it's almost all air and train concrete and then you got to go and measure things like making cylinders so for compressive strengths and curing those cylinders it's all important stuff and so there's things that i talk about um, some people are really focused on ASTM. Others are focused on AASHTO. So ASTM, if you remember, is more for what you think of the private sector, and it's actually it's also international. AASHTO is really just the 50 state DOTs of transportation organizations that make up those 50 state DOTs of federal highway. They're AASHTO, and AASHTO is great. ASTM is great, um, you know, and I'm just communicating their, in essence, equivalent standards, whether it's for sampling or making cylinders, whatever it is, there's a standard. And so um, this is just kind of a cool little reference chart to kind of help you if you're kind of confused on, well, what's the ASTM or what's the ASHTO number for this? And if you see something and you're more of an ASTM person or more of an AASHTO person, this chart can kind of help you out. So first thing, once the concrete gets the job site, you have, and it's being discharged, you got about 15 minutes to obtain your sample. And then you need and you have to obtain it. It's again, it's a composite sample. We'll talk about that. You also, and then you have after you the 15 minutes, you have five minutes to start testing slump, air, and temperature. And then, so also at that same time, to uh, if you have 15 minutes from obtaining your composite sample you have 15 minutes to start making your strength samples. So slump, unit weight, air, you wanna get that done, you know, as, as soon as possible. And, and you wanna get it done within the within 15 minutes so that you really just start, you know, you can start making your strength cylinders after that. So just kind of be aware of that and recognize it. And, and a lot of times really these tests can all be done by, with one person. So sampling concrete, 
Again, it is a composite sample. I've had people tell me, well, I've been testing concrete for years and it's never been a composite sample. I just took a single sample, you know, from the concrete and I just sampled and I've been doing that for 30 years. Well, congratulations, you've been doing it wrong for 30 years. It is a composite sample, meaning you're gonna take multiple portions, multiple increments, and you're gonna combine them together and you're going to mix them to one composite sample. And you want it to be at least one cubic foot is your minimum, especially for uh, strength. You, you have to have a, a minimum of one cubic foot. You really just wanna get a good, good wheelbarrow full, about two cubic feet if you can. And that'll get you, you know, for most tests that you're going to be doing, um, that's usually going to be pr pretty good. It also, so for ready mix trucks, you're going to get two portions and you're going to combine them together. So two increments for dump trucks. So say if you're doing a slip form paver and you're actually using a dump truck with a real, you know, real, real uh, low slump and you're dumping that concrete out of that dump truck. Really, you're gonna you're gonna have to go kind of like you think about aggregates and and, and uh, on a stockpile. It's, it's you know if you think about it, it's kind of similar, but um, you know there's concrete everywhere, so you really want to take five portions because that concrete can look a little different if it has some segregation issues. So you really want to take five different portions and put them together in one composite sample. So samples should be taken from the mixer discharge point. Pumped concrete um, has been at the point of discharge. ODOT is actually in the process of changing this to the mixer point of discharge. So what I'm trying to get at is for pumped concrete, the end of the hose is where a lot of people want you to actually test the concrete at because they think that's going to be what's most representative of the field. Um, and what we have actually found here at Oklahoma State so through some research we've done, that is actually not the case because um, your air meter is, um, it does measure air just fine, but there is some, um, you know, some some air that's actually in solution that the meter can't measure because the the air bubbles are actually reforming and so it takes you know more than just a few minutes for them to reform kind of like if you take a, a a coke can and you open it for the first time and you hear the tss tss and you see all the carbonation all those bubbles start forming everywhere um, very similar with pumped concrete you have carbonated, you know, air and train concrete, you pump it out and you get and the bubbles start forming again. That's, believe it or not, that's actually what's happening. And so you really need to take it before the concrete is, is pumped. That way you can actually get a pretty good accurate measurement. By the time that concrete's actually hard, we have found that, hey, actually, the concrete will be, um, will actually have a pretty similar um, air volume as before it was, before it was actually put through the concrete pump. So that's actually a pretty good indication. So a lot of people are actually changing their specs all over the country so that they do it at the point of, uh, at the end of the shoot for, for uh, you know, for, for drum truck. We should also say that third point for routine acceptance testing, samples can be taken after the one fourth of the cubic yard was discharged. So just acceptance testing, just to figure out if the concrete's gonna look good or not. You can go and get a, after the, after about a quarter of a yard comes out, you can actually go in and test it and say, okay, well, we accept this truck or no, we don't. Like I said before, you have a maximum of 15 minutes to obtain your composite sample. 
You're going to transport that sample to the testing area. You're going to combine those different um, increments, those different portions that you took, and you're going to combine and remix so that the sample is completely uniformed. Then you want to protect it from the sun, the wind, vapor, evaporation, contamination. You don't want wind blowing, getting soil all over that concrete sample. So you need to be careful. Lots of different ways to protect it. I've seen people use tarps. People, you know, a lot of times will move it over by the uh, underneath the, their truck. Um, they're testing where they're we're actually testing at. And they'll put it right underneath that tailgate and they'll throw throw something underneath it, um, a tarp or something on top of it. And that actually does a pretty good job. But, you know, however, however the test tester feels comfortable, there's a lot of different, a lot of different, you know, preferences out there that, that work just fine. After fabricating a composite sample, you got five minutes to start testing slump, temperature, and air content. And you also, from that start of fabricating your composite sample, you have 15 minutes to start molding strength cylinders for, um, um, for testing. So, you know, if you're making flexural beams, it's the same thing. You got about 15 minutes. So let's talk about the first, the most, the easiest test we can talk about. Temperature, usually... In that wheelbarrow, like you see over there, it's going to, you can put your thermometer, which is the thermometer kind of looks like it for Thanksgiving dinner. If you think about the thermometer to measure that turkey, it'd be the same thing, same uh, type of device, very, very basic. Um, I usually put it in one of those four corners of that wheelbarrow. Make sure there's at least a minimum of three inches of cover. You're going to close the gap around that thermometer to make sure that thermometer has concrete touching all around it. And you wait at least two minutes, but no more than five. And you're going to report to the nearest one degree Fahrenheit. One thing I commonly see new technicians do is they will actually grab that thermometer, they'll pull it out and they will read it. Nope, you need to read it when it's still in the concrete. I should also mention that most thermometers, like the one seen in that picture, has an accuracy of plus or minus one degree F. All right, so concrete temperature is very important to the quality of that concrete. Hot temperatures. So if your concrete's real hot, it's at 95 or above, you're going to get Quite a bit quicker sets, higher early age strength gain, but you're going to get a lower long-term strength. You can also get plastic shrinkage cracking, drying shrinkage cracking, rapid evaporation. I've seen settlement cracking. There's a lot of things you do not, that, that hot temperature concrete can do. You get crazing. Um, you just got to be real careful. You don't want that concrete getting too hot especially in hot weather concrete conditions, middle of summer. You also do not want the concrete getting too cold. In the winter time, that concrete, if it's, if it's not warm enough, you're gonna get slow setting times. It means it's gonna take a really long time to finish that concrete. You're gonna get lower early age strengths. You may get a little higher, higher age strengths so later on, as long as the concrete doesn't get frozen. Once that concrete gets frozen, you may drop, it may be half of what you're expected the strength to really be at. So you got to be real careful not to get that concrete to freeze. There's a lot of different recommendations depending on the dimensions of, of, of the concrete depending on what exactly the temperature really needs to be at. But if it's under 50 degrees F, there's probably going to have some problems. And if it's over 90 degrees F, you're probably going to have some problems.
So make sure, and one last thing, make sure your base, so your soil, if you're pouring on, on a subgrade, make sure it's not frozen or it's not too hot. So if it's frozen from the weather, then you got to let it unfreeze and unthaw or you're going to have some major problems. If it's over 110, you need to let, let the put some water on it. Cool it down, go pour it at three in the morning, do something like that. Um, a, lot of, a lot of good tips for hot and cold weather concrete in the ACI books. So let's talk about another, the, one of the most basic concrete tests out there other than temperature is slump. Slump is not a workability test, people say it is, but it's not. Look at the standard. It is a measurement of consistency of the concrete. That's very helpful if you're trying to understand um, through, through basic quality control principles, such as you have a slip form paver mix that paves real great about a one inch slump. And you're going out there in your first trucks, you know, maybe 1.25 inches, your second trucks right out one, your third trucks three quarters of an inch, then you're, then you're at uh, one inch again, and then you get to maybe that fifth truck, and all of a sudden you're at zero. Well, what happened? Why, what, you know, there should be a red, red flag comes down. Hey, hey, there's something going on here. What exactly is happening? Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's now, in the afternoon and it's a hot day out and your aggregate stockpile, um, the sprinklers didn't get turned on and you need to readjust for moistures now. Yep, all sorts of different things. The important part is slump gives you kind of a general idea of the flow for your mixed design to submittal and it gives you a great understanding about the consistency so how you run slump is you're going to dampen the cone. You're going to place it on a flat, rigid, non-absorptive surface. You're going to fill it up in three equal lifts by volume, 25 rods per layer. In that second and third layer, you want to penetrate one inch of the previous layer. So it's nice one monolithic sample in that cone. You're going to pick that cone up straight vertically. Um, upward and you got five plus or minus two seconds so three to seven seconds to pull that cone up so one mississippi two mississippi three mississippi four mississippi five mississippi is kind of what you want to count and pull that cone straight up you don't want to twist the cone you don't want to pull the cone in a in towards right towards the left you just want to pull it straight up. And then you're going to take that, like you see in that picture, you're going to invert that cone over, put, the, put your rod that you had um, on top of that cone, and you're going to measure how much that concrete fell. You're going to measure the middle of the displacement to the nearest quarter of an inch. So the, the cone is 12 inches tall. So usually you don't, uh, unless it's self-consolidating concrete, usually you don't get uh, anywhere, you know, usually you don't get a 10 inch slump or greater. And if you do, it's because it's, you know, self-consolidating concrete and there's another test for that. So um, you get about two and a half minutes to complete this test. Again, it communicates a workability range. So if you're at a zero inch slump, that's a very stiff mix. It may be great for certain applications. You may have um, roller compacted pervious concrete. There may be something really good out there. One inch slump, you know, is pretty stiff too, but it's great for slip form paving. A five inch slump, that might be great for a bridge deck or a floor slab. A lot of things when you're, you know, dragging with a come along. Uh, that could be work really great. You'd also have something more like a 10 inch slump for a pumpable mix, or maybe, you know, if you're tired of dragging five inch 
uh, five inch slump concrete and you want it to be almost flowable, self consolidating, you may, you know, order an eight, 10 inch slump. So you got the drag is hard. So there are a lot of different applications out there. When you get to self consolidating concrete, you really want to use a slump flow, um, which we won't talk about right now, but that's what they do a lot in the precast industry where you actually invert that cone over, fill it all the way up, and you pull that cone up, and you see how far it's spread in diameter, and you measure that diameter, and that can tell you a lot of different things. All right, so different workability ranges, like I talked about already. RCC, pervious slip form, usually some of the stiffer concretes out there. Things like pumped concrete and SCC concrete is going to be more the flowable. Should also mention that your slump test is invalid if your concrete is segregated. Because you can get some pretty wicked slump measurements and inconsistencies if you try to run them over and over again. I've had sometimes with segregated concrete, when the slump, you can get one one mix maybe you know roughly nine inches. Whenever you're when you pulling the cone up, your next test with that same mix may be three inches, and then it may go back up to seven, and then it may go back down to three, and it may go back up to nine. I mean, it it, it can be very inconsistent. And so the slump test is not is does not measure that. All right, so a test I helped I developed is my master's work. It's actually Ashto TP one thirty seven now. I wrote helped co write the standard. The box test is a workability test for slip form paving. So there's a lot of places all over the country. Um, I've had people from Europe contact us, South Africa, Australia, and they are all using this box test. And what's really cool about it is it's a workability test specifically for slip form paving. Real cheap um, test to, you know, very cost inefficient. Most biggest part is you got to buy a vibrator. Um, most vibrators for walls work just fine, which is, you know, a one inch vibrator at 1200 RPMs. And you make some wood, and there's these uh, wood forms that come together to make a box. I'll show you a picture of it. And in essence, you fill that box up, you consolidate that concrete, and then you pull the, the forms uh, off and you measure how well that concrete consolidated by the vi by the voids around there and you also measure edge slumping so um, this is really beneficial for trial batching so think about all the different places all the different components of a um, slip form paver we're just going to take out and look at one vibrator we're going to go in an up and down direction. So these are the different components. You got your forms, you got a platform, clamps, and a vibrator. You put the forms on the, the platform, have the clamps tighten up those forms. They make a 12 by 12 by 12 box like you see there. You put concrete in that box. Then you vibrate the concrete um, in those steps that are talked about right there. Pull that vibrator out, pull the forms off. Then you can go and look at all four sides. It looks like a little concrete brownie, and you can measure the honeycombing around it. So there's different rankings. We recommend a ranking of a two between 10 and 30 percent. Does a pretty good job for most vibrators for slip form paving applications. Um, we've taken this box test on a lot of different jobs when we developed it. That's how we developed it was next to a slip form paver uh, with concrete that was paving just fine. And so it, make, it makes a lot of sense whenever, you know, this is pictures from the Federal Highway Administration. 
going out and testing, you know, different mixes people are having problems with and guess what boom right here the box test whenever they went and did it right next to the paver they said hey box test is shown this is going to have some pretty bad consolidation and guess what when they paved with it yep right there on top um they could not go and close those holes they look absolutely hideous like I said before, you can also go and measure for edge slumping, top and bottom. You just take a straight edge and you measure how far it goes out. And you really want about any more than about a quarter of an inch is going to indicate you're going to have some edge slumping issues. So they took out the box test on another mix and boom, guess what happened? Box test said there was going to be edge slumping and guess what? There was edge slumping everywhere. They were not happy. Let's change gears a little bit. Let's talk about another quality control test. It's called the unit weight. Well, what is unit weight? Well, it's another name for density. So you can measure consistency, can help you understand the, your yield. So are you actually batching out, you know, if it's a 10 yard truck, is it actually 10 yards or is it nine and a half yards? So you can actually go out and you can to use unit weight to kind of help you determine that. It's also used, the unit weight pot is also used for the type B air meter. So you can kind of do, you know, both tests simultaneously together. Um, one builds off the other. So if you have a material, whether it's aggregate or concrete or whatever, and you put that in a known volume and you weigh that you weigh it all together then you can figure out your unit weight or density so pounds per cubic foot is what we're going to be using for unit weight so here's a unit weight pot in that picture which is the same pot, or i should say bowl which is the same thing we use for the type b air meter and you can measure your your container has also been called like i said a bowl a pot a bucket they're used interchangeably technically an air bowl or an air pot is roughly 0.25 cubic feet but a unit weight bucket is um that half a cubic foot is, is normally what i see and really the nominal maximum size plays huge a part into which one you want to use for your application. The goal is, is you want to, you want to use, you know, you want to, you want to recognize if you have you know, maybe a 57 stone, that's a one inch nominal maximum size. So you can use a bowl. Or 67 stone, you can use that, or you can use the bowl um, and have no problems. But if you are using a 467 stone, you really want to use a bucket. I know when I, one of my buddies was a dam engineer, he worked for the US Bureau of Locomation, so he was literally a dam engineer. And he would go out and measure um, with these really big buckets, much larger than, than a a half a cubic foot, he'd go out and measure the unit weight. So very big in and, and so just kind of be aware of that. So when you go out and you measure unit weight, what you're gonna do is you're gonna place that damped bowl, you wanna get it wet, you're gonna put it on a level surface and you're gonna measure if it is a if it if the slump is less than one inch, you need to vibrate it. If the slump is one inch or greater, you can use a rod or vibrate. Vibrating is always an option with 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 unit weight. People don't always talk about that because they would rather rod. That's what they're used to. We do it with slump. So let's just you know let's just do it. That's what we're trained on. But a lot of times it's really hard to properly consolidate slump that's at less than one inch. So if you're going to manually rod the concrete, 
you want to do it in three equal layers, 25 rods, you're going to penetrate one inch to the previous layer, and you're going to strike the sides 10 to 15 times with a mallet. I believe the standard used to say smartly 10 to 15 times. I don't really know what smartly is, but uh, I'm glad they, I think they finally took it out, so I'm glad they did. You're going to use internal vibration. You are going to do two lifts, three inserts per lift. And you really want to penetrate one inch in that previous layer for that second lift. And you only want to vibrate the concrete just long enough for it to respond to vibration and properly consolidate. You don't just want the vibrator to be held in one spot for a really long time and start segregating out that sample. But just enough to remove all those internal air pockets so you have a nice consolidated sample that's not segregated. And you're not pushing out the paste, you're not pushing the water out. Then you're going to each layer you're going to take and you're going to strike 10 to 15 times with a mallet. All right, so when you get done consolidating either with a rod or with an internal vibrator, that's when you take your strike off plate. A strike off bar is no longer allowed in the standard because you can get some waves in that concrete using a bar. So you're supposed to use a plate. I'm going to wet that plate down. You're going to go two thirds of the top surface, like you see there in that picture. And you're going to withdraw that plate in a sawing motion. So you're going to back it up in a sawing motion. Then you're going to return to that two thirds position. And you're going to strike off the remaining one third. And you're going to go in a forward, uh, just kind of like sawing motion. Then you come back and you hold that plate at an incline and you apply your final strokes to make it a nice flat surface. Then you're going to come by, you're going to clean any of that excess concrete around the sides of that container. You're going to record the concrete. Um, you want to make sure that you record the empty you know, eight pot that's, that's slightly damped. Then you're going to record the concrete with after, uh, or you're going to record the unit pot with the concrete that just got con consolidated and struck off and everything. And then you're going to do some basic calculations to figure out your unit weight. So your net weight is the container weight with the concrete minus the con the container weight. That, that gives you your basic um, concrete, basic concrete sample weight of that container. And then you're going to divide that answer by the container volume. So like I said before, it's going to be roughly 0 0.25 if you're using a, an air bowl for type B meter. You really should calibrate it because it's not perfect. Um, if you want to get real, real precise and accurate, which you should. So, yeah, if you're like me, you need an example. So an empty bucket is 7.95 pounds. When I run the unit weight and I put that, that concrete sample that, that's in that bucket that's together, maybe I measure 45.41 pounds. And then I already know that from calibration, the, the volume of that bucket is real close to 0.25, so 0.2491 cubic feet. So what is my actual unit weight of the concrete? Whoop. That's supposed to be, uh, got a little extra four in there, but 45.41 pounds minus 7.95 pounds of all that divided by 0 0.2491, which is 150.4 pounds per cubic feet. So if you do your math and you get under 140 or above 155, either you did your math wrong 
or you're not dealing with normal con normal weight concrete. So kind of be aware of that. So if you get a lower unit weight, meaning your concrete's lighter, you're probably going to be over yielding, meaning you have more than 27 cubic feet. Could be caused by additional water that's being added. See if you have higher water cement ratio and higher air content, maybe you have a change in your materials. Um, there's all sorts of different things that happen. If you have a higher unit weight, that means you're going to probably be under yielding. So you're going to have, you're going to be, um, you're going to have less, not more. I apologize. I got a little, that's wrong too. Uh, a little bit less than 27 cubic feet. So that's going to be caused by maybe lower water cement ratio or error water content, I mean, changes in your proportions. There's a reason why you're under yielding. So what's under yielding again? Well, like I said, a perfect yield is one cubic yard or 27 cubic feet. So over yielding is when it's greater than one yard. Under yielding is when it's less than one yard. So you want to make sure that you're providing, you know, you're, you know, as a concrete producer, you want to make sure that that you're you not undercharging somebody or you're not giving away the concrete, that you just give exactly what they ordered. That's how you stay in business as a good company. Contractors want to make sure they get ex they get uh, at least as much as they paid for, so they really don't like it when they get shorted. So just kind of be aware of that. So let's switch gears. So we talked about unit weight. Let's talk about type B, air meter, which measures the total air volume. This is the most commonly used method to measure air. Should hide, I should highlight that you cannot use this for lightweight concrete. We have technically in the lab, and you can use it up to maybe 30% lightweight aggregate replacement if you hold down the press release and you do a couple tricks that, that we know, your meter will actually read it. However, that is not the standard. So I wanna be very clear about that. The standard does not allow you to measure lightweight aggregate with that meter. You have to use the roll, the roll meter or the volumetric meter, which we'll talk about in a second. People absolutely hate it. They can't stand the other meter. Um, and here in a minute, you will know why. So the type B air meter, it is a more probably the most difficult test to run is air meters in general, the type B probably comes in a short second behind the roller meter, which we'll talk about shortly. But, but air is, is going to be in concrete no matter what. You have what people call non-air and train concrete. So whenever you don't add an air and training agent, you just mix up the concrete like normal, you're gonna have maybe up to 3% air. That's just, which that's just within it, within the material, um, how it's mixed, the, you know, the water has air in it. Um, there's just a lot of different reasons why you have up to 3%. And most of this is usually larger air bubbles. And then if you want to add an air and trainer for freestyle re resistance, um, you can add a, a chemical air and trainer and usually people they'd want to you know usually five six seven six and a half seven is usually what people want to for air and train concrete so type b air meter can easily do this you're going to follow the basic sampling you know basic 
procedure for making a, you know, just like unit weight, three layers, 25 rods, penetrate one inch of the previous layer. Then you're going to strike each, each of those three times. You're going to strike 10 to 15 times with a mount to close those holes left by the rotting. Um, and then in this standard, you can actually use either a strike off bar or a strike off plate. And I'd still prefer just to use a strike off plate. And you want to clean that rim really well so you don't get any sand on it whenever you put down that rubber gasket um, um, on top of that on top of that unit weight pot you want to make sure it seals really nice so you also have four clamps that's going to clamp together to that pot you're going to fill up after it's on there nice and tight you're going to fill up the water into the pepcocks and keep those pepcocks open fill up water and it might take quite a while to put all the water in there that water is there to remove all the error that is in between the lid and that concrete. Once you have that, the water coming out the other side and you want to jar, um, jar, jar the whole meter kind of a couple times just to make sure you have all the water, all the air pockets out, you will actually um, pump that chamber up to your initial pressure, initial IP. And then you want to stabilize the air. You want to wait for a second. Tap the back of that gauge. Make sure that gauge stops moving. Then you close those pepcocks. In the new ASTM that just came out, you actually have those pepcocks closed before you pump up that chamber. In the, in the ash toe, it is after you pump up the chamber. Really the biggest difference is, is the reason why you do it, uh, why Ashto has it is because that chamber can technically leak. And so that would be a good way to figure out if there is a leak. Um, but either way, I think we can argue back and forth which, which, which one's you know, more important whether you want to leak or by keeping those things up whenever you're pumping it up, you could accidentally hit the release valve and shoot some water at somebody. So, you know, I think both are valid points. Either way, um, once you pump it up to that initial, initial pressure, that's the initial pressure number on that is on us specifically for that meter. So it could be 3.2. Um, it could be four right at four um there's a lot you know two one but there's a little initial ip initial pressure um under zero and you can kind of find it there if you look at that meter i think i have a picture to kind of talk a little bit about that in a second then after those pepcocks are closed and your gauge is at that in, on the initial ip you're going to hit the pressure, you're going to pressurize that sample, hit that pressure release, and you're going to hit it with a mallet 10 to 15 times smartly. I believe that's still in the standard. So try to hit it. And after, after that gauge, you tap the back of it. Everything kind of, you know, um, levels out. You measure it to the nearest 0.1%. So if it's right there at 2.3%, the needle is real close to 2.3, then you say it's 2.3. Um, so common problems with these type B meters, you're gonna have the main seal can, can, can leak. You're gonna have a broken or a loose clamp. The bowl or the rim can, can leak causing or the, maybe the rubber seal needs to be replaced. All three of those can actually create a main seal leak, which is around the, the lid, in between the lid and the unit pot, unit bowl. You can also have a pressure chamber leak. 
a lot of different a lot of different reasons why you can have one. Um, but I've seen it where it's in the pump or the bleeder valve or in the actual pressure release. A lot of different reasons why. And also I have a lot of problems because you don't have a very experienced technician that's dealt with leaks. Um, that's dealt with this meter before so they have a lot they usually have a lot more tendency to have leaks and problems um, getting the type B working right. This is a complex meter so a complex test compared to something like temperature or slump so there's some more problems. Also the, the amount of time it takes to run air can um, it, it's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit slower than, or it takes a little bit longer than running slump. So, all right. So let's talk about the volumetric, that rollometer. So again, it, it, people use it a lot of times for the lightweight aggregate. It is an alternative to the type B um, for, yeah, so for Oklahoma DOT, that we whenever they certify they will actually use the type b or the roller meter you can use either one aci fill grade one certification you got to actually go and um and you you have to be experienced in both so you, it's not one or the other but for the ACI fill grade one, you have to be both an experienced in the roller meter and also the type B. So type B, pretty much what, what your goal is, is you have your concrete and you are trying to break all that concrete completely loose to measure the total air that's in that concrete. You, it, it requires isopropyl alcohol and you got to do a lot of moving and shaking and rolling and inverting that, that meter and rolling it back and forth. And it can really put, you can really time a lot of time and energy and sweat in you. And you can get uh, false results or results where you need to redo the test again. So there's a lot of places that just do not like using it. I also want to talk about the super air meter. So the super air meter is another thing that we helped develop but here at Oklahoma State University. Ashto TP 118. So this is like the Cadillac of air meters. It's really cool. It's going to take you a little bit longer to run than your normal type B. There's a little bit more there's uh, more pressure steps to it than just the first pressure step to get your air content, but it can tell you not only air content, but it can tell you the bubble distribution. So you're going to pump that meter up to 14 and a half, just like you do and hit the release button. The release button is what, the, what that green line is down there. And you're going to pump back up to 30. Hit that release button, hit it with a mallet 10, 15 times, pump it all the way up to 45, hit that release button, hit that with a mallet 10 to 15 times. Then you're going to release the, the air from that pepcock, you're going to add more water, you're going to close that pepcock, pump it all the way back up to four, 14 and a half, Re uh, hit release, hit the Hit the release button and hit it with a mallet 10 to 15 times. You do the same thing again at 30 and 45. And that difference in your change with your four, with your 45 numbers, 45 PSI numbers, that change is called the super air meter number or the SAM number. And that actually can tell you bubble distribution. So bigger that number, the more, uh, the bigger the air bubble. So um, in essence, is what it's trying to say. So let's compare the type B and the SAM. 
So you got six clamps, you got a digital gauge, you got a bunch more pressure steps with the SAM, but it does tell you air volume and distribution. Distribution of your air, bu of your air bubbles is real important for freeze-thaw durability. Type B only gives you your air volume. So, but it, it's a lot shorter of a test. So just kind of be aware of that. So one thing I always get commonly asked questions about air dosage and all problems related to air. And I want to communicate when we talk about air problems, I'm not talking about necessarily running the test, but just air problems with concrete in general, anything can affect your air dosage. And I mean that anything can pretty much affect your air dosage, temperature, weather, gradation, cement, your fly ash, it has some weird admixture cement incompatibility issues. I've seen that, uh, you know, pumping concrete, vibration, can all affect your air and how much air you need to add, chemical air and trainer you need to add to get to maybe six and a half percent air. A lot that goes into it. So you can be chasing air bubbles all the time like my son Sam in that picture there. So just kind of be aware. Um, what variables make you chase the air so that maybe you don't have to run as fast. You head it off by working a little smarter little, instead of a little harder. All right, so we talk about strength samples now. You must have enough strength to resist load in general. You want your concrete not to be too weak. So compressive strength is what we focused on for years when we talk about strength of the concrete. Contractors even get paid on it normally. You know, if you meet the strengths, then, you know, usually you get paid. So slump, air, and temperature must be performed when making strengths samples that's really important to realize that so ash toe standards for odot so t23 making and curing sample cylinders t22 and compressive strength cylinders so when you need to actually break your cylinders there's two different tests they're not the same test you know some people would think oh making and curing you know is for for strength samples um, that, that's just for cylinders. No, it's for flexural beams too. The, the, you know, there's, there's, whether you're talking about Ashto or ASTM, there's a standard just for making and curing strength samples. Then there's another standard out there for just compressive strength and breaking and breaking it. And there's another standard out there just for flexural beams and how to break them. So it's real common for cylinders. Um, you're going to do four by eight. You may see a place where it's six by 12, but usually they're four by eight cylinders and they want to know the 28 day strength. For flexural beams, um, probably the most common, you know, you can actually use different size of flexural beams, but probably the most common is six by six by 20. And usually they're at either 28 or 56 days. So what is compressive strength? Compressive strength is the ability of a material to resist compression. So, you know, like in this, you see a hydraulic press where that concrete is being pushed in two different directions. It's actually being crushed together. And that's what the contractor gets paid on. Most projects, they want to look at 28 days, sometimes it's seven days. That's just for normal concrete, you know, somewhere between three and 6,000 PSI. It's pretty common. For high early strength projects, meaning they want 3,000 PSI or 4,000 PSI, some, some number like that, maybe at 14 hours or one day, three days, you know, then that's kind of high early strength. They may also talk about an ultimate high strength, meaning 
meaning they want the concrete to gain, you know, maybe it's 12,000 PSI. They want that concrete to be at within 28 days or 56 or 90 days. So usually when you're dealing with 15 or 18,000 PSI, when it starts getting above, especially 12, they're going to start requiring 56 and 90 days just because of because of how um, how long it takes for concrete to, to cure and gain strength. Um, it can be really not so economical to design mixes that are that strong in, in 28 or even seven days. All right, so I already talked about four by eight, six by 12 cylinders. Um, usually you're gonna have three samples per test. So if you're measuring about seven days and 28 days, you're gonna have three cylinders at seven days and three cylinders at 28 days for four by eight cylinders. Again, six by 12, you only need two samples per, per day you're gonna break. Just like we talked about with unit weight, that slump value, less than a one inch slump, you can vibrate. If it's more than a one inch slump, then you know you can use a rod or you can even use a vibrator. You can use vibrator for almost everything up to self consolidating concrete. So for manual rotting, for four by eight cylinders, you're gonna do two lifts. For six by 12, it's three lifts. But either way, you're gonna rot it 25 times. So four by eight cylinders have a much smaller rod than six by 12 cylinders. So be aware of that also. Either way, you're going to penetrate one inch the previous layer and you're going to lightly tap 10 to 15 times on the side of that mold. If it's a nice steel mold, you can use a mallet and you can tap it a little harder to get things consolidated. If you are using like you see in that picture where they are plastic molds that get removed very quickly, if you, if you hit it with a mallet too hard, it will break it. So you gotta be very careful. That's why a lot of people use an open hand and they will tap it. I should also point out that using the, uh, the steel rod that you, that you have for consolidating, if you use that to tap the sides of the cylinder, that is actually not part of the standard. So just kind of be aware, just kind of saying that. So if you're going to do internal vibrating, you do uh, four by eight cylinders. There's actually two lifts. Um, you're going to penetrate in the previous layer one inch, but you only have one insert per each of those lifts. Uh, six by 12s, you have two lifts, but there's actually two inserts. And again, you only want to vibrate concrete just long enough for it to respond and, and provide, you know, and, to, and, and for it to be properly removed that any of those internal voids. And you, again, you want to lightly tap 10 to 15 times on the side. So this is some really good pictures to kind of help you out. If you have no consolidation whatsoever, that's on the very far left. You have a little bit, or you have no penetration. Um, you you rod two, you know, your first lift and your second lift, but you don't actually rod in the middle. You don't actually get that one inch penetration. Then you may have it like you see there, where it looks great top and bottom, but not so much in the middle. There's kind of like a little line. If you don't tap the side, sometimes you may have some little voids like you see there in that picture. And then on the very far right, that's kind of your ideal consolidated um, cylinder, which isn't real in life. You don't always have it come out perfect. If you do, good for you. So there's a metal cylinders like you see down there. What you want to do is you want to strike off the top of those cylinders. You can, use a, you can use the tamping rod, you can use a float, you can use a trial. Your goal is you want to produce a flat, even surface with minim, min, minimum manipulation. And you want to cover it with a lid, um, something that's non absorptive, something that won't absorb all that water out of the concrete. 
So I've actually seen up places, been to, this is actually a pre-stress facility where um, they make, they make their, their, their cylinders and they never actually put a lid on it because, hey, you know what, it's in a lab, it don't matter. No, that's not the standard. And this is technically not really in a lab, it's in an open um, environment. So whatever the temperature outside is, is the same temperature that's gonna be in there. So, you know, you need to, you need to be real careful. So when you're labeling your cylinder, especially in the field, you want to put time, date, project, um, you know, what the concrete's actually being sampled out of. So is it a uh, footing or is it a wall? Where is it kind of located? Kind of explain some of those details in the application type. And then you're going to put your name if you're the technician. You're going to put the technician's name. One thing that's really cool is we actually here at Oklahoma State, we've actually developed C tags or concrete tags, which is kind of embed them into that concrete. Kind of works like a bark. It's like a barcode, kind of like you see there. You have the outside, you have a little sticker, and you also have the inside that has like a little ball, the, uh, Velcro on the inside tag. So after you fill up your concrete, you see the third picture is actually the little tag that's embedded in that concrete. You can scan it and it actually tell you what that cylinder is. If you input the mix design to the app, it'll tell you, you know, the mix design, tell you when it, who made the cylinder, when it was made, what it's out of, if you fill all, all that information on the app. So it's a pretty cool little thing um pretty pr pretty cool all in all then we also have these standard lab cure samples so after you go out and you make your samples you label them and everything now you need to cure them well there's two different types of curing you have a standard lab cure sometimes in those standards they'll just refer to it as a standard cure which is really which is you know a two two phase process. You know, you have your initial field cure, which is normally 24 to 48 hours. So you make your cylinders, you leave it on the job um, in a curing box. Um, you come back the next day once the once the cylinders are hard enough to be transported, you transport them back to the lab. And then you put take them and you put them uh, demold them and you actually put them in in water or um, in a curing room that's moist moist cure so that really helps out so standard lab cure that's going to be whenever you have acceptance testing quality control testing or trial batching you're going to do that basic standard lab cure and one thing I should say is the curing box is extremely important. There's supposed to be temperatures on that curing box that you're supposed to be measuring and making sure your cylinders don't get too hot or don't get too cold. When I was in the cement world, you know, people would call up me and say, Dr. Cook, you're the cement person. Cement equals strength. Why are my getting low strengths? It happened every winter and every summer. It was very plain that sometimes people were not properly handling and storing their cylinders. So this is one, one job went on to, and this was a curing box. This was their actual curing box. That's great that, you know, maybe you protect it from the sun, but uh, you didn't really protect the temperature or anything like that. So, you know, you really need to get a real curing box, not a cardboard box, because that creates false data. So that's kind of what a moisture cure room looks like with shelves, but you have your cylinders labeled, put them in there. What I, what I should probably say is from whenever you take your cylinders on the job and you transport it to the lab, you get a minimum of, of eight hours after you make your cylinders. 
um, you know, after final set. So make your cylinders and the concrete finally sets up. After maybe, you know, maybe after two more hours, then you get eight hours after that. So maybe eight hours minimum or 10 hours minimum before you can move the cylinders. But you do have to move them and demold them within 48 hours. You also need to make sure your labs within four hours of that filled, uh, of, of, you know, from whenever that was made and tested and everything to whenever it was actually um, demolded and everything. And you're going to relabel those cylinders. You're going to be stored in a curing room, 73 degrees. Um, you can have them in a curing bath. You really only want water only. For your for lime water bath is actually for your flexural strengths only. So just kind of be aware of that. So when we talk about field curing samples, field field controlled temperature and moisture is what we're trying to focus on. So you're going to provide a cylinder with the same temperature and moisture as the concrete structure that it was taken as the supposed to represent. <coughs> so you're going to store, so you're going to make, after you make your cylinders, you're going to store those cylinders in, either in the structure or around the structure somewhere, somewhere where the cylinders get knocked over or damaged or anything. And you want to put it as uh, close as representative as possible. You don't want to, you know, you don't want to move it completely out of the way where it's really not representative of, of the concrete that, that the sample was taken from. Um, and you really want to store that until it's going to be ready to be tested. And you do this type of field curing. So you wait, wait, so, you know, maybe it's, maybe you want to figure out, okay, we got, one day we need to have at least 3000 PSI for this high early strength concrete. And so you make your cylinder, you keep it right next to the concrete and about, you know, you have about three hours. You think, okay, well, I, th I feel like, I feel like uh, we're at, you know, it says 24 hours. We need to move all the shoring. So, we're at maybe 18 hours, so let's go ahead and take a cylinder and break it and see where we're at. Nope, oh, maybe we need to wait a couple more minutes or a couple more uh, hours because it's not exactly just there just yet, but we're pretty close. So field curing samples, it's used to determine when a structure can be put into service or when shoring can be removed. So remember that. Another thing when we talk about compressive strength and especially at early ages is maturity monitoring. So measure, so actually understanding how much um, heat's being put off. So calorimetry, that can kind of tell you a lot about your setting times and your early age strengths. And this maturity monitoring can kind of correlate quite a bit to that pretty cool but you got to realize the maturity monitoring that's only for a specific mixture uh, a new mix requires a new maturity index and this does not replace cylinders it just kind of helps uh, is used as a tool so that you can better understand um, when you need to maybe go out and break a cylinder just to to make sure that it um, complements your um, what you're what you're monitoring, so you don't have to go out and break a bunch of cylinders just to figure out. Okay, well, it's finally ready after you know 27 hours, but we've been breaking cylinders every hour for the last 10 hours. Um, the, the maturity monitoring can actually you know do it in a way where you may only you may not have to break very many at all cylinders to, to, to be able to real, to be able to, um, you know, it's more predictable. 
All right, so we talk about checking cylinders. A lot of people, when they go out to break a cylinder, they should check those cylinders. They really should. They should make sure that they're, you know, if they're perpendicular, the diameter is like a circle and not a football, and that there's no depressions on the top or bottom. Believe it or not, in the standard, it doesn't talk about depressions on the sides, honey coming on the sides. But obviously, if there's honey coming on the sides, you may have not actually made that cylinder properly. So, but there are, you know, perpendicular and diameter um, requirements. A lot of people like to talk about capping too. And do you use neoprene pads, a sulfur capping, or do you not do any capping and you just kind of grind the ends? Well, if it's under 12,000 PSI, neoprene pads are probably the most commonly used um, caps for cylinders. You need to make sure you realize that um, you got to replace your pads every 100 uses. And you can't have splits or cracks that are greater than three eighths of an inch. A lot of times, if you know if it's above twelve thousand, you're going to go and you're going to try to grind it. Make sure everything's nice and flat. You also need to measure and make sure the height isn't uh, didn't get ground down too much, where you have to put in an adjustment factor. Sulfate capping. It's something that's kind of old school, and I only know a few um, places in the country that still do that. So I won't talk too much about that, but it is kind of old school um, how, how it's done. So let's talk about breaking concrete sample. So the, t so the time tolerances, obviously for 12 hour time tolerance, is going to be a lot different than a 28 day time tolerance. So for 12 hours, you get a plus or minus uh, 0.25 hours. For 28 days, you have plus or minus 20 hours of your whenever from whenever they were made. So you don't have to break at 28 days exactly at the same time that you made them 28 days earlier. Um, there are some basic tolerances. So how are you going to break your machine? Or how are you going to break your, hopefully you don't break your machine, how you're going to break your sample is you're going to use a hydraulic press and turn that hydraulic uh, machine on, let it warm up. You're going to adjust the upper bearing block to make sure that it's uniform and it's set nice and pretty. Um, you're going to then align up your moist sample into that machine, make sure it's going to be broken down properly, and then you zero out the, the actual gauge on that machine before you even think about loading that sample. You should also state, I don't know how many times I will see machines that are not properly calibrated. So a lot of times it's overlooked. You're supposed to calibrate machine every, at least every 13 months. Um, if there's any repairs or any adjustments, anytime there's a question of the accuracy of that machine, you need to make sure you get your machine recalibrated. Do not overlook that. That's something that's very common. People are complaining about not getting proper strengths. And then you come to find out that they haven't had their machine calibrated in three years. And they're and it's really off. So after you go, you're gonna apply a full load until about half the anticipated maximum load is obtained. So once you have the machine on, the samples loaded up in there, you start applying the load. You're gonna go and actually check to make sure it's it's actually the top and bottom. Um, once it gets uh, barely loaded, you're going to check to make sure that it looks great, that everything's, that everything, it's all on there correctly. And if it is, then you imply the full load for about half of the anticipated max. So if you're thinking it's going to break at, say, 4,000 PSI, you can go and crank it up uh, until about 2,000 PSI. 
and then you need to cut it back to 35 psi per second. Once the concrete is has a very well defined fracture pattern, you can turn that machine off. You can see here in the picture that um, there is a basic fracture pattern that is being shown. And that's actually kind of what you want. You don't want the cylinder to, to be even barely broken. Um, you want to see a nice, a nice fracture pattern. Um, a lot of machines I've used are actually automated. So you just hit a button. So there's no increasing half load to, and then decreasing it to 35 PSI. There's none of that. So once, once you break your cylinders, you always make sure that you report the maximum load that it took to break. You calculate um, the, the stress, the, near, the PSI, the nearest 10 PSI. Um, and then you also ca uh, communicate any fracture patterns or any defects. If you have a bunch of corner breaks, uh, if you have a corner fraction like right there, then you actually have um, some problems with the with it being loaded properly. So kind of be aware of that. So which cylinders are properly broken? Obviously the one on the very far left is not. The second one, the third one, probably all those are not broken properly. The one at the very, very, very far right, the, the last two are broken properly. Those three, others three that we didn't really talk too much about, we could kind of argue the case for some of it, um, but at the end of the day, they should probably be broken down a little bit more. So what's your standard deviations? Well, according to ACI 214 for normal strength concrete, um, compressive strengths, there are some basic standard deviations for different performance ratings if you're talking about a lab or if you're talking about the field mixes. So as you can look for field and for lab, they're actually double. If it's in the field, it's double the standard deviation as for a normal range. So the effect, the parameters affecting strength, obviously how you make and you cure your cylinders are a big deal the symmetry and the perpendicularity of those cylinders um, can really change um, how well those how well the fracture patterns occur and where concrete breaks at capping whether you use neoprene pads or you're using some other method you need to make sure that you have a nice uniformed um, um, nice uniformed load that is put through the entire um, cylinder as opposed to just a point load. You don't want point loads. Um, again, you want to make sure your, all your equipment's calibrated. You want to make sure your mix design and the mix design submittal process is, is being done right. Um, and then you need to make sure that your cement and your secondary cementitious materials are all fairly consistent. So the flexural strength, so we talked about compressive strength. Let's talk about flexural strength for just a couple minutes. Um, probably there's not, like I said, not a standard size, but there are two different basic sizes, either a six, six times six by 20 or four times four by 14. Usually six by six is what I normally see. You can have a, like this picture, um, there are two, two point loads there um that are going down so you can also have just a single midpoint load right there um, there's two different flexural tests this is the one that oklahoma dot uses right now um, roughly 10 to 20 percent of the compressive strength is actually the flexural strength so when we talk about making concrete beams Four to eight inch beam widths. You're going to be using two layers, one stroke per each um, two inch. So a six by six by 20 is going to have 60 strokes per lift. 
you're going to penetrate in that last, that second layer, uh, at least one inch, and you're going to tie it with a mold, usually with a hammer. You're going to lightly tap it to close those rods. And then you'll just strike off the top. A lot of times people will use uh, floats to do that. For internal vibration, you have one layer for four to eight inch beam widths. And you're going to insert it um, every so, so often, no more than six inches um, in intervals. So minimum for a six by six by 20, you're going to have at least four. You really only vibrate just long enough to consolidate the concrete. You're going to tap it with, uh, tap with a rubber mallet to, to close those um, holes. And you strike off the top. Um, like I've already kind of talked about, there's lots, there are a couple different ways. So the flexural beam, the three, the third point is what um, ODOT uses. And the load rate is 150 pounds or PSI per second. So 150 PSI per second, you're going to load it until failure. You will record pounds and PSI to the nearest 10 PSI. Um, so just kind of be aware of that. So how does all this kind of play into effect? So you make three concrete cylinders, the minimum compressor strengths at 3000 PSI and all three of your cylinders are above that. That's great. You don't have a low break anywhere, but what does this really all mean? How can you get, you know, how can you get a very wide spread from 3190 to 3670? How is that fairly normal? Well, the variability of your testing can be from, you know, sampling error and testing error are, are two common problems. We try really hard sampling and testing error to cover in this class so that that's reduced, so that you're nice and competent for sampling and testing concrete. We also have where you have material source variability. We can't really control that. So whether that's the concrete or a material that goes into concrete, sometimes there's some variabilities that go into it. So we use statistics to talk about what the average and the standard de deviation of that concrete really is all about. So you have a lower standard deviation, it's being more consistent, a higher you're going to have be much more or less consistent. So for this example, you can add up the three cylinders divided by three, and you get 3,427 PSI. You obviously round up to um, 3,430 for the PSI. And then the standard deviation for that is 240. So you can see that little star is actually where the average is compared to where your cent those three cylinders are. So not too far off from the middle. Well, what if we do another pavement mix and we got 3190, 3420, and then we got this one is boom all the way up there at 4360. Wow, it's pretty far off. Well, what does that mean? So the average would be somewhere in between your second and your third compressor strength result, which is quite a bit different. 3190 is quite a bit different from the average. So just kind of be aware of that. And that's where your standard deviation comes in, where it pretty much doubled, tripled or whatever, because you have such wide variability. So a lot of times with DOTs, they're going to get paid, like I said, off of compressor strength. So how many times did the average meet the acceptable limits for getting paid? And so how the standard deviation, how far were you within the percent within limits? You might say percent within limits, what is that again? I go, well, you got your average, then you have far, how far your standard deviation is. So if you take about, if you go and you make, you know, maybe a hundred, hundred different uh, concrete mixes, the same mix, hundred different samples of it, and you made a bunch of cylinders, you'd actually find that 
your cylinders are gonna are gonna break something maybe maybe like this. So what do you do? Well, you know, and uh, um, your cylinders there's gonna be some variability. They're not all gonna break at say 3,400 psi. Some will break even lower than 3,000. PSI, some will break close to 4,000. That's normal. There's going to be a standard deviation. And with that bell-shaped curve, you know, it's, you can kind of understand some of it where, you know, customers that own, own their concrete, they are going to have, sometimes they may have percent within limits. So there may be that they say, hey, I went within two standard deviations. I want the concrete to be tested and to perform within two standard deviations, within 95%. And so they may go out there and do that. One thing that's really important um, is for DOTs, what they will do, and a lot of other people, they'll actually require um, a mixture design and the materials to be submitted before, before any of the project gets started. And then once they go in and review all that and they approve it all, project you know, really starts a lot. Um, and then they'll start actually pairing their T-test on split samples. And what I'm saying is, is the contractor's gonna go out and he's gonna take samples um, every so often when he's needed. And then the, in the state DOT, they may come out or owner's representative or somebody, they may come out and at a less frequent pace, they may go and actually um, do, do, do sampling too and, and testing too. And so those from the contractor or the, the third party lab or whoever in that state DOT, they may compare both of their numbers together to figure out if they're happy with it. Um, and again, I'm not going to get too much into lots and sublots and stuff like that, but it's important to realize that um, you get paid off of lots and sublots. So um, just kind of be aware that, in essence, the frequency of your testing and, and where you test is all really important and you can get paid off of all of it. And so this is just some basic procedure from I think Oklahoma DOT on how they get paid. So if the per percent within limits is at 90%, then you get full pay. If it's at 90 to 100%, then you may get a bonus, which is really cool. So with that, I just kind of wanted to talk about different quality control methods. Um, I hope you learned something. Um, have a great rest of your day.